Hello everyone, I'm Rudraksh Parikh. I'm a maintainer of CubeArmor and a software engineer at Aquinox. And today I'll be talking about securing Jupyter Notebooks using CubeArmor. What are Jupyter Notebooks? They are tools for simple and interactive computing, popularly used for creating data science, scientific research, and machine learning workflows, amongst other use cases. And they have multiple deployment modes. However, the one that we'll be talking about today is Jupyter Hub. Jupyter Hub allows you to create large-scale multi-user deployments of Jupyter Notebooks, though it's noteworthy that CubeArmor is able to protect all of these environments. CubeArmor is a CNCF sandbox project for runtime security enforcement. It does so by monitoring activities like process execution, file and network access, capabilities usage of processes running in your systems using eBPF, and it enforces user-defined policies for restricting the above activities using Linux security modules or LSMs for short, like BPF LSM, AppArmor, and SE Linux. It is able to protect workloads running as Kubernetes pods, Docker containers, bare metal VM processes, and so on. Now let's take a look at the deployment model of Jupyter Hub and try to analyze its attack surface. We have a Kubernetes cluster, which is running multiple instances of Jupyter Hub, all isolated by different namespaces, which are targeted towards different groups of users. And within a namespace, we can have multiple pods. Each pod be belongs to a specific Jupyter user, and these pods are managed by the Jupyter Hub deployment itself. So, the thing is that these pods are accessible over the Jupyter Notebook web UI to the user, and the user is able to do all sorts of things like execute code, execute commands, or access remote servers within the web UI itself, and all these commands will be run here. The attack vector that these expose are remote code injection, of course, through the web UI itself, someone can run malicious code, which might harm the cluster itself. Then there are container escapes. A user might be able to escape from their designated container to a different user's container within the same namespace or a different namespace, and so on. So now let's go over a quick demo where we'll be taking a look at a Jupyter Hub environment and protecting it using CubeArmor. So I have a three node GK cluster here, which is running two instances of Jupyter Hub, namely Jupyter Hub group one and Jupyter Hub group two, which are running into two different namespaces. And you can see there are existing Jupyter Hub pods here already. So what I'm going to do now is I'll be creating a new user through Jupyter Hub's front end and then doing some things for it. So I can get the IP address that, uh, that is uh, exposing the proxy, the Jupyter Hub proxy. And Now I'll create a simple user here. Let's just name this user, user one, user, user one. A uh, thing you'll note here is that I haven't really uh, set up a domain for this environment. Neither have I set up HTTPS because it's just for demo purposes. Uh, however, it's not a recommended best practice to do so. Please make sure that you have these enabled. And I'll log in. Simple password, simple user. Again, not a good best practice. So uh, when you see a new user is created, what Jupyter Hub does is it creates a new pod for me and it creates a persistent volume so that the user's data can be persisted and a couple of other things that it does. And I can see that my user spot has been created and it's running.
So now that I have access to the Jupyter Notebook environment, I can do a couple of things here. I can create new Jupyter Notebooks, Python Jupyter Notebooks, or uh, create a new notebook. Uh, I mean, access the Python console itself or execute some shell commands using the terminal. Uh, however, what I'm going to do is uh, upload an existing Jupyter Notebook that I created already. So you can see that what I'm doing in this Jupyter Notebook is downloading a malicious binary, which is present at a remote URL using an internal package. And then I am installing it at a path that is not on the path variable of user and then i'm executing it and later once i'm done with my work i'm also removing it so as to leave no clues behind so you can see that it's this easy to execute any malicious code into this environment now let's see what can we do what can be some mitigations on it so how can cube armor come into the picture here cube armor will monitor all the activities of the jupyter notebook users that are running on your jupyter hub environment and then based on those activities you can make some observations and create uh, policies that will allow you to restrain the users uh, what restraints are we thinking about here for example we can allow users to execute binaries only from specific paths so this will ensure that they can't download any binary on their own path and run it. And they will not be able to write these binaries, write any new binaries to the path that are reserved for system binaries. And then will only allow access of network to Python programs. This will also reduce the attack surface so because the users won't be able to run any shell commands which might spawn a reverse shell or something and then we'll prevent them from installing any global python packages and also we'll be following this uh, these are some of the recommended and some additional best practices that jupyter hub themselves suggest for running your environment you can take a look at them in the official documentation so yeah now how will this work and will all my things continue to work so how we're going to do this is when we install cube armor cube armor will uh, export these telemetry events and these events are exposed for all your process executions file and network accesses and then you can consume these events through dashboards TUI based dashboards or GUI based dashboards and based on the observability that you gain from these oops, and based on the observability that you gain from these you can uh, create policies cube armor policies what we'll be defining in those cube armor policies for this these two things uh, so basically in Jupyter environment the binaries uh, mainly reside in user local bin and slash bin directories and any regular user should be able to get uh, all of their things done with only access to these so they'll only be executing from these paths and no other path outside of this will allow process execution and they won't be able to add any binaries to these paths so to take a look at all these things let's first uh, install QArmor So when I go to QPharmer repository, I have this getting started guide. And in this getting started guide, it's so it's simple to install QPharmer. You just have a couple of help commands. You can directly copy these. Now you see when we install QPharmer, The first component that gets created is the QBarmer operator. QBarmer operator is responsible for managing all of the QBarmer containers. It deploys a snitch job 
on all of your nodes so i have three nodes here so for each node a snitch job was created snitch job goes over each of my node and analyzes it like a couple of kernel primitives that a cube armor needs and accordingly configure cube armor for you and install it upon each of your nodes so it's so easy to install and cube armor operator takes care of all the configuration you don't have to worry about all of them then another thing that gets installed is the cube armor relay so the telemetry logs that are exposed by cube armor daemon set are accessible uh, by the cube armor relay and they are present at a single point here so any consumers can connect to cube armor relay and get those logs so now that we have cube armor running let's try a few things out we'll also use the cube armor helper binary here so cube armor has this client binary cube armor client which you can use for doing a couple of things like observing what all is happening basically your telemetry logs or getting all the alerts and some more things that we'll uh, look upon so uh, you can install it using this path but i have it installed already so i'm just going to execute it the command to be executed here will be kramer profile and let's take a look at quickly what all we can do so in the profile command i can specify a namespace at the namespace level at which namespace level i want to observe all the events happening or i can specify a pod this will bring in all the uh, executions and accesses happening at the pod level similarly i can do it at the container level as well since we only want to observe our jupyter user one here i'll only specify this pod so kramer profile pod equal to jupyter user now what i'll do is execute the exploit again And you can see that I got the logs here for all the things that happened within that program. Like uh, first, let's start with the network calls that happened. So you can see that it accessed a remote IP and downloaded something. Then we can see that a fire the binary that was downloaded and executed the home jobian slash exploit binary. Now I should also be able to see file visibility. However, by default, CubeArmor disables cluster level file visibility because there are a lot of file events happening all over your cluster and it would be difficult for you to make sense of all of them. So the recommended thing you can do is to enable file visibility only for the workloads that you want to monitor. So I want to only monitor the Jupyter Hub Group 1 namespace, like the file accesses that are happening on the Jupyter Hub Group 1 namespace. I'll simply add a Kubernetes annotation to it. So it goes like kubearmor visibility equal to process network file. What this says is have process, have network, and have file. All these kind of telemetry logs exported by kubearmor. So once I'm done with this, I'll be able to see all the file accesses. Let's execute this exploit again. So we can see that when this gets written to the path and what all is happening. So now you see, uh, this program executed and it tried to write to the slash home slash jogging path. And this action was passed because there is nothing stopping from it happening right now so let's go a step further and now we can see what all is happening let's try to uh, make some policies make some cube armor policies for restricting this so what i have here is a cube armor policy cube armor policy is a, a custom resource that's for cube armor this custom resource is for protecting the pods itself or the containers themselves and there's another resource the cube armor host policy it's very similar however the only difference is cube armor host policy is for protecting your node and cube armor policy is only for protecting your container so what this policy says is 
uh, it has a name and it is going to be applied on a namespace. I have chosen the Jupyter Hub Group 1 namespace because that's where my user resides. Then I have a couple of selectors here. What these selectors are, uh, let's quickly describe my user pod. So if I take a look, describe pod, what's the name of my user? Jupyter user 1. Now you'll be able to see that these labels are taken from the pod itself. Uh, the app Jupyter Hub label is common to all Jupyter Hub pods. So we take a further label component single user server. So for each of the user that signs up, the pod that is created is the single user server pod. This is the component that Jupyter Hub calls it. So we take this as well. What will this ensure? That enforce on the containers or the pods which have app Jupyter Hub and component single user server labels. We can go further and use the Jupyter org slash username label. What this will ensure is that this particular cube armor policy only gets applied for this user. However, currently what I'm going to do is apply this to all of my users. So let's take a look at the policy itself. You can see the policy is divided into rules, the things that we monitored there, file accesses, process executions and network. All of them are rules here and there's an action. This action is a global level. You can also specify action at the uh, per rule level as well to have more granularity. So let's observe what this file, uh, what this uh, file rule is trying to say. What we say is allow any directories, any file accesses in directories, user local bin, user bin and slash bin all these directories to be read only so this is one and we also say that allow uh, slash user slash local slash uh, this path this path is basically the path where python installs it global packages so we'll make this read only as well so users will only be able to read it and not able to write it from it uh, write on it now you might be wondering that Jupyter Hub, the environment that Jupyter Notebook runs in is uh, not a privileged user anyways, it's the Jovian user and by default it doesn't have any privileges. So using the Linux discretionary access control or DAC permissions on these files, user won't be able to write to these anyways. So how is it going to make any difference? The thing is that in certain use cases, your user might require pseudo privileges or root privileges, or a uh, user might be able to uh, exploit some vulnerability and based on that, get privileged access to the environment. So we don't want to take any chances here. What these rules will ensure is that when cube armor is running, even the root user won't be able to do any of these actions. So this keeps us safe in all the manners. Now, this is another rule that we have specified so that other file accesses that are relatively safe are allowed in the slash directory or the root directory. So this was the file rules. Now let's move on to the process rules. What the process rules say here is that match these directories, user local bin, user bin slash bin, and the user should only be allowed allowed as the global rule says here to execute from these paths and no path outside these. So the scenario that we discussed that a user was able to download a binary in their environment and execute it uh, in their home directory and execute it, that won't be possible anymore. And similarly, this last network rule say that users should like only the Python programs should be able to access network and no other programs should be able to do so. So let's apply this policy and understand what kubearmor will do here. Since it's a Kubernetes resource, only a kubectl apply will get our job done. Now that my policy has been created, let's use a command to observe what I'm going to use is kyarmer logs. Kyarmer logs will stream all the logs from my 
relay server and present them to me. I'll use the JSON flag to see all them in JSON. You can also get them in plain text and I'll beautify it a bit. So what this will do is get all alerts of all policy violations. So when I execute this now and there's a catch in it, what will happen is the user is able to execute the binary and I get an alert here. You see the action here is audit. So what does audit mean? Audit means that you only want to get the alert and don't want to enforce on the user. This is the default posture or the zero trust posture of QBarmer by default. You can change this with a simple annotation. How you can do that is kubectl annotate ns and just like we had earlier kubearmor cube file posture and we set it to block. What this will means is if any of if any of the policy violation occurs, kubearmor will not only audit it but it will also block it. So uh, the user will get a permission denied there. Now I'll apply it and let's try executing again. You'll see that I am not able to do so. So just like this, you have protected the environment from any malicious execution. And I also get an alert here that my user tried to execute something, tried to execute home job in exploit binary. And while doing so, the action that took place was block. The result was permission denied. This matched the default posture that you have set. And I can gain further insights in which user it was by the owner information about the workload that QBarmer sent. So basically it was a pod, which was the name, which was of the name Jupyter user one running in the Jupyter Hub group one namespace. So this will help me decide that user one is either compromised or is not acting well. So I can take action accordingly. QBarmer has done its job of saving you at the moment. And this is where QBarmer shines. QBarmer uh, alerts you as well as blocks you with something called inline mitigation. We'll take a look at it later. So that's another thing that we have done. Now we also might want to verify if our regular programs are running fine. How I'm going to do that is by running a simple Jupyter notebook, which runs some Python code. I have it already, so I'm going to upload it. And now that I have it, let's uh, execute it. So you see that I'm still able to install packages the packages are getting installed in my local directory and not in the global directory and no module name matplotlib jupyter sometimes fail to detect new package installations let's try to execute this again So now we executed it. Basically what we did here was import matplotlib, impl imported uh, numpy and then wrote some sample code for plotting this simple graph using random values. So you see I'm able to do my regular operations pretty well as well. So no user uh, behavior is changed. Now another thing to notice here we have been getting the alerts and all these telemetry data in the CLI itself right now and in the DUI based dashboard. However, you might want to have a richer interface for these. So for that, uh, QBarmer Relay has these integrations which you can use and these are very pluggable. So you can either use any external SIM tools like FlowND or Sentinel and export the visibility logs there 
or you can use tools like uh, open telemetry so basically qparmer has this open telemetry adapter which gets the logs from qparmer and exposes it in open telemetry format we have a sample dashboard which is uh, consuming these logs and showing them on a grafana and loki dashboard you can also use we use a kibana dashboard that's been created by the Qbarn web community. There's an entire repository for these dashboards. So this is all possible to be done using UIS as well. And it's been done in an extensible format so that you can create your own dashboards. Now let's go further and take a last look at another thing. So the policy that we created just now was based on the observations that we did. However, there are frameworks like MITRE and CIS, NIST, and they recommend some best practices for hardening your environment. So QBarmer has this repository, community created repository, where we create policy templates of all the policies based on the best practices recommended by these frameworks. You can check this repository out. And you don't have to manually decide what all policies do you want for your environment. There's a handy command for that called the KRML recommend command. I can use it and I can specify a namespace while using it, which will, what, we, what it will do is go through all the ports that are present in my namespace and recommend me some policies for protecting them. So that ensures that I'm keeping up with the best practices. So the namespace is going to be Jupyter Hub group one. Now what this command is doing is it's scanning all the images that are present in my environment or in the Jupyter Hub group one namespace and accordingly taking in policies from the jupyter uh, the policy templates repository so you see it has created all these policies where you can according to your board apply them and it explains what these policies are for they are dumped on your file system and i can apply them as per my wish so that's for the demo and let's proceed further. Now that we have seen QBarmer in action, let's take a look under the hood and find out how QBarmer does it all. QBarmer has these two components at the kernel level, namely the system monitor and the runtime enforcer. The system monitor is responsible for hooking EBP programs onto certain syscalls and kernel level functions so that it can observe whenever they are triggered. And the runtime enforcer is responsible for converting QBarmer's policy to LSM native rules. Together, these achieve alerts and enforcement. However, in the user space, QBarmer also integrates with Kubernetes APIs and container runtime APIs so as to get all the metadata about your workloads. And QBarmer puts them together and ships them in form of alerts and telemetry so that every user can make sense of the kernel events that are coming in through the association with their workload. It's important to note the approach that QBarmer takes to achieve runtime enforcement. As mentioned in the demo, it is different for QBarmer. Generally, the approach that is taken by enforcers include killing the entire process or container in response to a threat detection. This is also called post attack mitigation. However, this is not optimal as it gives attackers sufficient time to cause enough harm on the system already. Also, this leads to some or other sort of downtime of your applications as well. So how does QBarmer handle it is through LSMs. Through LSMs, we are able to achieve something called inline mitigation. And with inline mitigation, it is possible to alert 
as well as prevent it before the threat executes due to the paths that lsms take so to summarize jupyter notebooks are essentially remote execution toolkits and it is essential to secure the infrastructure that they run on the jupyter community has suggested to have some sort of protection at the kernel level and this is where cube armor shines so check out cube armor deploy it and do join the slack for any feedback or queries thank you